Today, the reason that you own a fondue pot but don't know where it is, we're going to start thinking outside the pasta box. And are you scared to jump? That's our topics today, Tuesday Talk Live. We're together again. Hey, everyone, it's Chef Todd Moore. Uh, if you are, I'm so glad we're together live again. I, I just really look forward to Tuesdays because I love doing this. But if you're watching this on a replay, you need to go to webcookingclasses.com slash live and uh, register for my alert system. So usually 15 minutes before I go live, we put out an alert. It's a great way to communicate with me also. So uh, webcookingclasses.com slash live if you are watching this on uh, the recording right now. I'm Chef Todd Moore. You know who I am, right? I used to be that guy. <laughs> I was a sales guy, a person with another career, frustrated that I can't figure cooking out. So I quit my job. I dressed like that, like that, <laughs> and uh, got a job steaming oysters in the back of a restaurant here in Baltimore, Maryland. Eventually, threw away my entire life to enroll in culinary school, graduate so I could become a carefree cook. What's a carefree cook, you ask? A carefree cook is someone who creates their own recipes. And when you do this, it, the social benefits of this are amazing. You bring friends and family together. And plus, when you're a carefree cook, you don't just blindly follow instructions and then start again next time. You learn every time you cook. And this enables you to define your own cooking style because you're practicing pro methods. And eventually what happens is that you love you're cooking. That's what a carefree cook is. That's what I want for everybody all over the world. And that's why I'm so passionate about doing Tuesday Talk Lives and teaching people and, and just changing some of these bad thoughts that are out there about cooking. Oh, I've got a what am I for you today at the end of Tuesday Talk Live. I'll give you the answer to this. I'll give you a minute. This is the what am I. Those three things what just what am I here I'll give you a closer look at it and I'll give you a minute to check that out it's the Tuesday talk live what am I for the week stick around to the end and we'll give you the answer if you know what it is go ahead and uh, put it in the comments right now and you'll know what it is let me check here see where everybody is uh, if I'm getting comments yes hi Carol hi Adam Bill is here from Cincinnati Ohio Rachel is with us. Uh, Bob Dudley is with us as well. That's good, good. I see the answers coming in so I know that you can hear me and we're communicating well. That's good. Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you own a fondue set? A lot of people do. Uh, second question. Excuse me. Second question. Do you know where it is right now? Uh, yeah, probably not. Most people don't know where that thing is. And this is something that popped up in our Carefree Cooks community this week. Uh, Jason, one of our, our tremendous Carefree Cooks, the things that he posts. Uh, but Jason asked about fondue. Like, does anybody do fondue anymore? And this started a spark in my head immediately. This is a, a Mad Men throwback kind of thing. Fondue is the type of thing that's in the back of a garage somewhere. Maybe physically your fondue pot, but in the pantheon of cooking things, it was a fad. It was a trend that went in and out very quickly, and it used to be really popular. But the reason that my culinary wheels started going is because, I, I mean, I consider myself a teacher first and foremost, an educator first and foremost. And I think what people don't understand, like, like a lot of names in culinary, fondue is not just one thing. There are so many definitions of fondue. It doesn't have to be a Swiss long fork and a 60s, you know, dance party. That's immediately the image that comes to my mind because there are so many uh, definitions of this. And traditionally, really a fondue comes from melting cheese in wine. Now, today we know, like I wouldn't recommend, if we were starting out to make a great cheese sauce to dip things in and so on, I wouldn't say bring some wine to a simmer and throw cheese in it because <laughs> so many things wrong with it. Wine is acidic, right? Acid is the way cheese is made in the first place, right? You take cream, you throw rennet in and acid, it breaks the emulsification of it. You skim off the way you make 
cheese that way. I'm, I never understood why an acid and cheese would go together until I started reading about it a little bit more. And the reason that it would go together is because water was not good. You couldn't really trust the water. Milk and cheese, if you've ever tried to melt cheese in milk, you find out what's wrong with that. Um, and there were very few liquids that they could really depend on that would be safe to, to do this. So the first fondue, yeah, was wine with melted cheese. Um, in uh, uh, classical fondues, really, when you look in uh, the repertoire de cuisine, when you look at uh, Savarin, writings of Savarin, things like this that go way back, really the classical fondue was kind of somewhere between scrambled eggs and a souffle because this melted cheese was thickened with, with eggs, and eggs have a leavening effect. Today, if you talk to a, a contemporary French chef and talk to them about fondue, fondue is actually really finely chopped vegetables that are kind of braised, cooked for a long time, low and slow over a long period, until they get pulpy. You know, you like think if you ever overcooked uh, broccoli or asparagus, it gets very pulpy. So this is the the more contemporary thing, and that's used as a garnish. Well, the the introduction of cornstarch to Switzerland around 1905. This is what changed the fondue world because now this problem of adding an acid to cheese that is not never going to give you a smooth sauce, the the cornstarch enables you to get this emulsification going, to make a creamier sauce. And this is when the definition of fondue really became a creamy cheese sauce. Now, bring that to the 1964 New York World's Fair, and that's how it lit fire. That's how it became everything to everyone in the 60s and synonymous with the 60s. But I'll tell you today that our fondue is not a fondue without the introduction of cornstarch. And this brings me to a sauce making lesson because it's time to take that fondue pot out of the garage and don't melt Velveeta in it. Okay, that's what they might have done in the 60s. That might have been another thing, the advent of Velveeta, although Velveeta way precedes that. Um, but now is the time to be able to make a really good sauce. Like if you want to do a fondue, this is no different than making your cheese sauce for mac and cheese. This is no different than a, a cheese sauce on a burrito or a chicken cordon bleu or anything like that. The basic combination of a good roux, milk, and then any kind of cheese you want, that will make a better cheese sauce than trying to melt cheese in wine. Also, you can mount that sauce with some sherry or some liquor at that point. That's a lot more flavorful. Cooking directly with wine just gives you that kind of acidic taste. But look, don't stop there. Once you pull that fondue pot out of the garage and apply sauce-making methods, the ones that will come out with a really good sauce, not a grainy, stringy sauce, well, like I said, don't stop there because then you could go to chocolate fountain, right? Think about just melting chocolate. And you would be wrong. You can't just melt chocolate because it will burn on the fondue. There is always something added to it, either a fat or a, a milk or something. Again, we've got this emulsification process with fondues. And I think this is part of the reason that people put their fondue pot in the garage because they always came out with a grainy, stringy, whiny, cheesy, acidic kind of thing. Try chocolate, uh, a dessert fondue. Uh, in uh, Japan, they have a nabe mono. Nabe mono is basically a one pot noodle, fish, shellfish dish most often, but everything is cooked in the simmering liquid. So now a fondue doesn't have to be cheese. A fondue doesn't have to be chocolate. Um, think about Vietnamese pho. Pho is same type of thing, P-H-O, simmering hot broth with the items cooked right in it. Um, speaking of hot, uh, the Japanese have shabu shabu. This is when you take raw pieces of meat and you fry it right at the table. And it's another type of Swiss fondue. This is really dangerous, okay? And this is another reason that a lot of those fondue restaurants went out of business because this is a, just a lawsuit waiting to happen. Just imagine knocking the table or reaching for your drink and putting your elbow in boiling liquid. Now, you don't want that. And this whole idea of dipping bread in cheese, dipping meats in oils, it, it goes so far past the Swiss, it's medieval is what it is. 
because this all comes, if you want to know some culinary history, this all comes from a sop, S-O-P, a sop. And a sop, when you really didn't have much food, you had bread and you might have had a broth because you had bones or pieces of liquid, what they would do is soak a piece of bread with the broth and you would eat it in medieval times. It was a sop. If you were lucky enough to have some gravy in the picture here, you had a gravy sop or a broth sop, and now you know why you take a piece of bread for that gravy of liquid, and what do you do? You sop it up, right? So the culinary history of fondue brings us all the way to medieval times of wiping broth in bread and sopping it up. So this is something that doesn't deserve to be in the garage. This is something that I really want you to examine this week and think about your sauce making skills no matter what you want it to do. Um, very similar to sop is Welsh rabbit. Now it's not rabbit, okay, it's not made out of a rabbit, it's a rare bit. It's basically cheese toast, but it's a cheese sauce on the sop broiled. That's a cool thing to go with your pasta dish, right? That's a cool thing for a lunch or to put uh, meats on. And you know, now when you get outside the fondue pot, that's when you start looking at things. Oh, please. Seriously? <laughs> I found this picture. Do you really need frozen cheese toast from Stouffer's? No. You can start cooking on a slab. You know, and you've heard me say this before, someone that is skilled at controlling heat should be able to cook on a hot rock. And this is what I mean. Heat a slab up in your barbecue grill or your oven and you can actually sear very thin pieces of meat on it, go for your dipping sauces, things like that. It makes for a great meal. Fondue should come out of the closet, out of the garage. And don't forget about our fondue uh, etiquette also. In fondue etiquette, no double dipping. You don't dip it, take a bite, and dip it back in. That's no good, right? And this is something a lot of people don't know. You don't even bring it to your mouth. The fondue etiquette is actually uh, dipping the item in the boiling liquid. Of course, you wouldn't go right to your mouth, but in the cheese or chocolate, let's say, and then from the fork to the plate, and you put the fork back in the sauce. So the fork is never supposed to go in your mouth if you're now going to throw a fondue party. And here's another thing. If your piece of bread falls in the sauce, you buy a round for everyone. That's fondue etiquette. Uh, okay, it's time to start thinking outside the uh, pasta box because in our Carefree Cooks community this week, uh, people are going crazy with their pasta. And here's something that I read this week, and I was at my mom's. Everybody saw I was uh, in North Carolina at the beach catching clams, and my mom and I were talking about pasta. We're both foodies, although I hate the term. We love to talk about food. So we were talking about um, fresh pasta versus boxed pasta. And, you know, there are taste tests and some people say you can't tell the difference and our carefree cooks most certainly can. But we were looking on the internet and she came up with an article that talked about the texture of the fresh pasta on, on kind of like a microscopic level I'm, I'm talking about. Basically, without the long story short, it holds on to the sauce better than the boxed pasta does. It has to do with the way that it's extruded so this penne pasta here, this ziti that was done by the thousands of pounds in a machine is a very, very smooth pasta. Sauce runs off it. If you want your sauce to stick to your pasta, so to speak, start making your pasta your own because when you make the dough, there's a lot more texture to it. There's a lot more holes in it. It isn't done in a billion gallon mixture and extruded through a stainless steel high pressure uh, device. You're making it yourself. And this is one of our carefree cooks here. This was so cool. Adam, Adam Price made three kinds of pasta this week. He did a regular semolina, a spinach, and then a squid ink pasta. I mean, how cool is that? So you make the pasta. He did some scallops. And this is another great thing about fresh pasta. You don't have to boil it first. Why would you take that fresh pasta that is a lot more like a sponge than your boxed pasta is and put it in water and let it absorb all that water first and then throw it in your sauce and then it expels all that water in your sauce? Why would you do that? Make fresh pasta Put it right in your sauce and let that texture absorb all that sauce. It does a better job of it than uh, your boxed pasta does. And Adam finished this dish with the, the combination of all three and some scallops. Brilliant. Adam 
Is there a recipe for this? No. <laughs> I'm sure there's no recipe for this. Adam is a carefree cook. He creates it himself. Beside the formula for pasta dough, which is so easy. If you're not making your own pasta, man, you're missing the boat. Um, this is Anne, uh, one of our carefree cooks. Anne did a tricolor fettuccine. She made these uh, one pasta dough, but she separated it into three, and she colored two of them. We teach this in web cooking classes. One with spinach, uh, one with roasted red pepper, and a basic semolina pasta. And she put the three of them together after running through her uh, pasta fettuccine maker. And look at this. With a pork loin? What a beautiful dish, you know, to be able to make your own pasta. And then it's a beautiful side dish as well to something else that you do. Forget about the stringy types of pasta. Check out what Charles did this week. This is one of our members who's always posting photos. This is brilliant. This is pea agnolati, or little raviolis. So Charles did a, a puree of pea with some ricotta cheese, put it in a piping bag, as you can see, piped out a long row on his homemade pasta dough, folded it over, put his like end of his finger in there to crimp it, then comes through with his pasta crimping tool, <laughs> and he makes pea ravioli. You can't buy pea ravioli. You can only make it. And it really is not hard to do. Uh, Don Traub is busy with it again this week. He's also doing scallops, but I thought this was a brilliant presentation. Little pasta nests. Who says pasta always has to be a gigantic mound of something in a bowl? Little pasta nests with a scallop on top, some asparagus, uh, some uh, grated Parmesan cheese, and white truffle oil, uh, Don is telling me. Uh, another one of our carefree cooks, Padrino, he's fashioned himself this pasta drying rack. So he's making the fresh pasta, drying it, and he'll be able to use it on his own in the future. He's making his own pasta sauce with one of our lessons from web cooking classes, the tomato concasse, the way to seed and skin tomatoes. Amazing. And, you know, even the side dishes that would go with it. Nancy is making this beautiful zucchini, to slices of tomato, Parmesan cheese. <gasps> Man, if that stuff don't make you hungry, <laughs> you know, to start making your own pasta, it's really, really cool. And that's the kind of fun that people are having in our Carefree Cooks community. And, you know, you might say, boy, that takes so much time. You know, these people must have so much time on their hands. Or, I, I don't think they do. You know, they, I hear from so many of them. They work. They have jobs. The difference is they enjoy it. You know, they, they look forward to to making pasta. They are proud of the results. To me, that, that's worth, I don't know, it's not much time, even if it is extra time. But I'll tell you, when you learn to cook by method and make that pasta like that, it actually saves you the time. So think out of the box when it comes to pasta, and you will so enjoy pasta more. Uh, the last question I have for you today is, are, are you afraid to jump off the diving board? I mean, are you, are you afraid to just jump right in? <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite television shows is Sunday Morning on CBS, and I, I'll admit I took this story and this idea from them because there's a guy there named Steve Hartman, and <laughs> just the mention of his name <laughs> makes me choke up because he does these heartwarming uh, lifestyle stories, and it was a story about a little boy who was petrified to jump off the diving board, and it's only 20 inches or so. Um, and I identified with this because... You know, I think I was always a teacher, maybe. Maybe I was just born a teacher educator because when I was a kid, I taught swimming. I was a certified water safety instructor from the Red Cross. I worked for the county department of parks and recreation, and I went around teaching swimming, and I loved it. So if anybody knows what it's like to tread water for a full hour with your hands out like this and a line of five to eight-year-old kids all petrified to jump off the diving board. I'm the guy that knows what that's like because I was in the water going, come on, John, come on, you can do it, come on. And they're at the edge of the board trembling, no, no, no. And they turn around and they run back the other way. <sighs> and they go back to the end of the line. And the next one, come on, come on. And eventually, you know what happens? One of them, bonsai jumps off the side, all their fears cast aside, they leap off the top of the board, they usually jump over my, my head, you know, I'm there to catch them, they, they usually clear my head, and they swim immediately to the ladder, what's the next thing they do? They push their way to the front of the line, 
I want to do it again. I want to do it again, right? Let me do it again now that my fears are gone. So I started thinking about this and I remembered so clearly my days of teaching swimming, my days of catching those kids off the diving board. And of course now I'm, I'm teaching cooking to tens of thousands of people all over the world. And I got to ask you, do you have a diving board? Because I, th I think a lot of people do. I get comments every day, every week. Chef Todd, is it a tablespoon of thyme or half a tablespoon? For goodness sake, that's being on the edge of the, the diving board. Chef Todd, should I cook at 350 or 375? You're petrified. You're on the end of the diving board. Chef Todd, I bought this such and such, or I didn't buy the, this cut of meat because I wasn't confident I would cook it. You're on the end of the diving board. At some point, you got to jump, right? you you, you got to take that leap. You, you have to say, even if I fail, I will have learned something. But you know what happens? You jump over my head, <laughs> right? And swim right to the ladder. And then you say, what else can I do? Now I'm going to do a twist. Now I'm going to do a cannonball. Now I'm going to do the can opener. Now I'm going to, and that was the kid that I had to throw out of the pool when I was on the lifeguard stand because he wouldn't stop diving in the pool, you know? You get so excited. So here's my thought for you this week. When you look at your cooking, where are you on the edge of a diving board? Where are you that you say, uh, that, that's a hurdle I'm not going to get over because you know on the other side of it is great things. So I asked you last week to think about what type of cook you are, where you are on that level of cooking. You know, are you, are you using convenience foods? Are you uh, using healthier foods? Uh, do you have only a few ways that you cook? Do you have five dishes that you're confident in, but you're on the edge of the diving board for all the other things? Once you've identified yourself with that, the next assignment is, what's at the bottom of the pool? You know, like what's going to take you there? If you learned how to make sauces, we were talking about fondue. Um, if you felt like you really needed to keep the moisture in a pork chop and not dry it out. Those are the things that that's your leap off the diving board. So in this next week, now that you've identified where you are and where your um, challenges might be, think about the thing that you're going to be so proud of when you're climbing out of the pool ladder, walking to the back of the line to jump off the diving board. Again, think about that because that's the thing that gets you to the next level of being a carefree cook. That's the next thing that gets you to where you want to be. It's the one that's off the edge of the diving board. And I was so taken, as you can see, by that story because I lived it myself and now I can feel it. You know, I just, with these messages that I'm getting, it's just, don't think about measurements. Don't, don't think about time. Don't think about that it might go wrong. These are ideas from recipes. Think about you're like a painter, like you're a pianist. You're, you're just going to let it rip. You know, you're just going to let it fly. That's the way to do it. That's the way to, to, to move forward in your cooking. Hey, what's everybody saying with us today? Our carefree cooks out of the... Thanks, Guy. Guy always likes my pun. Uh, think out of the box for carefree cooking. Um, Rachel loves my photos. That's good. Everybody's guessing the what am I. Uh, if you haven't seen the what am I, I'll give it to you one more time. Here is the uh, Tuesday what am I. Uh, that's good, good. Oh, Nancy doesn't have a fondue set. Eh, you're, you might not be missing much, Nancy. Like I said, you can make yourself a cheese sauce. Um, a, friend of, a friend has two fondue sets. Okay, that's good. Hi from Arizona. Hi, Bonnie. How you doing? We're Tuesday Talk Live together again today. Let me see if I can see any comments, questions. We're looking for, yes, a lot of people are getting this right. I'm going to tell you the answer at the end. Uh, oh, who's telling me this? Yeah, Pat uh, DeJesus was one of those kids. Uh, oh, went through ice, but now he's a certified scuba diver. There you go. There's a great testimonial for jumping off uh, the diving board because that's really what you have to do. Uh, so our, uh, let's see, where else are we? Oh yeah, hey, thanks so much for everybody that was with us last week. Uh, did you check out the fried clams episode that I was able to come into the kitchen and cook with my mom? Nothing better than cooking with your mom, <laughs> right? Uh, so we had a lot of fun, and yeah, I know mom said she didn't want to be in it, but she snuck in the background there as well, and man, she's gotten a lot of love <laughs> for it since. We're going to try and do that again. I'm starting to think about this more and more. We should be cooking together, right? Like, I can 
can do these Tuesday Talk Lives, but what about actually cooking together? So if you have any suggestions for how like a, a live cooking segment might go, uh, maybe we uh, you know uh, come up with a list of ingredients and we cook that that night, or uh, we have a voting for I, I don't know, but uh, you know we have thousands of people here that are carefree cooks. We should be able to come up with a good idea that we might be able to cook together again. Um, hey, don't forget if you are not currently a carefree cook, if you're watching what's going on here, scratching your head and saying, what, what are they talking about? That all sounds so good to me. Uh, then go to webcookingclasses.com, click the get the guide and get my, get my five forks to carefree cooking guide. This is the way to start your journey. There, there is a path from, that I took and I showed you from sales manager to culinary educator and carefree cook and I felt like I had a fork at each time. I could choose one road or I could choose the other road. I could choose one path or the other and this is the guide I eventually came up with to help you make those decisions toward becoming a carefree cook. If you don't have it, go to webcookingclasses.com and uh, you will see the guide there at Web Cooking Classes. Get the guide. Uh, let's see, the what am I? Uh, the Tuesday what am I? Uh, this is pesto, and so many people got it right. Alan has it right. Tom got it right. Nancy got it right. Yeah, most people, I can't read everybody that wrote pesto. Most people got it right. And what you can see here is it's some basil, it's some pine nuts, and uh, olive oil. There we go. I have trouble pointing. <laughs> and olive oil. So we make a pesto. So this kind of goes with our whole pasta discussion today, right? And it's another way to talk about the emulsification, mixing two unmixable items. So the reason that fondue died out like the dinosaurs was because of grainy sauces that were not emulsified. One of the reasons that pasta sticks together is because of the protein power of the egg yolk. And the punchline to all this is your pesto stays together because pine nuts actually have a small emulsifying quality. So you need the pignoli. The Italians will tell you pignoli. You need the pignoli in your pesto, otherwise it's gonna break like everything else. So a little emulsification uh, lesson this week. Uh, the uh, Tuesday What Am I, again, is pesto. So hey, thanks everybody. I got to all the questions. So many people were right. I'm so glad. Um, Joan, you can, yeah, you can put grated cheese in pesto if you want. Uh, it's, there are three ingredients in a classic. Uh, Anne watched the fried clam uh, video. Joan misses Long Island a lot. I hear you, Joan. It's old home for me when I go. Cool, cool. I see everyone. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Tuesday Talk Live. We'll be together again next Tuesday. And until then, this is Chef Todd reminding you uh, that there's a method to your cooking success. Bye-bye, everyone.